Yes, thank God. Praise the Lord. God bless you this morning, this evening actually. Amen for coming out and God bless you this morning as well for coming out. And we had a wonderful time this morning. God was in the house. Amen. I'm going to preach uh, another interesting sermon uh, and it's been one of those topics that I've always been curious but I've never understood in detail why God did this. But until I started to pray about it, God started to speak to me. I want to preach uh, this evening about the tree of life. Amen. And so if you turn to your Bibles in Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, and then we're going to read to verse 9, and then we're going to uh, further on to 15 to 17 as well. Now, in many gardens around Australia, uh, there are many trees that produce, and uh, it seems to be very easy for certain types of trees to produce. The ones that produce really well are the weeds, you know this? You try to kill them and they still survive somehow. Uh, I, I, I have a lawn, a, a patch of grass at the front of my house, and the very limited amount of grass I have, I still get weeds. And so I decided one day to go and buy myself um, uh, what they call a weed, and uh, I think it's called weed and feed, and where you spray it onto your grass, it feeds the grass and supposedly kills the weeds. And so, you know, this boiler was not that cheap. It's about $20. And I'm there hosing this baby down, going, I want to make sure I kill every single one of these weeds, you know. And as I'm doing this, uh, a couple of weeks later, I see some brown patches. And it's killed some of my grass, but not the weeds. <laughs> so it must have worked out that some of my, what I thought was grass was actually the weeds. And what I thought was grass was actually, what I thought was weeds was actually the grass. But I believe that there's things there that need to be still killed off. But I also have in my backyard uh, these little succulent plants. And um, uh, I'm not sure if you know what they are, but they're little plants and they're, they're quite easy to grow. And what you can do is you literally can just pull off a leaf or a branch of these succulents, just stick it into the, the dirt, put some water on it, and within a few weeks, a few months, a plant just automatically comes out of it. And the reality is, it's that, you know, that type of plant is my type of plant. I love that type of plant. You know, it doesn't take much effort. You know, it doesn't take much skill. But you, you just get nice growing plants. So if you ever want a succulent, just come to me. I'll give you one for free. I've worked out how to grow them. And they're very hard to kill, which is even better. All right, so if they're hard to kill, easy to grow, it's, it's a winner. But the thing is, when you go to the shop to buy them, they're very expensive. So you just worked out that the shop is ripping you off now. <laughs> but, but so you can come to my house, I'll give you some for free. I've got some quite exotic ones too, ones that um, I, I, I found out that cost a fortune. And so what I did one time was I actually went to a, a, a nursery and I was looking at the, the different arrays of succulents and you know they move them around and some of the branches fall off so I just take a leaf and the branches fell on the ground put my pocket I went home and stuck it in the ground and it started to grow <laughs> a free plant and I say that not because I'm you know I, I can't grow these plants I'm just realized that they're so easy to grow you can do anything with them you know what I mean and so I've even got a still into it and she she goes oh can I plant this and she'll just cut the part off and stick it in the ground now, the reason I say all this is that there are plants in our lives which are very easy to grow, as you know, but then there are plants that are very difficult to reproduce. And so in the Bible, it talks a lot about plants. I'm not sure if you noticed that, because in that era of time, a lot of people used to be farmers. And so it talks about plants and it talks about how the plants relate to people and give examples of life attached to plants. And so if you read from Genesis chapter 2 now, verses 8 to 9, I highly recommend you bring your Bibles to church because you don't want me to be making up stuff. And so you want to read it together with me. It says here, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put man whom he had formed. Okay, so man was created. All right, not, a, not, not from a monkey. Okay, just let you know. If someone calls me a monkey or came from a monkey, that's an insult to me. All right, if the next you know, evolutionist says, oh, now we all came from monkeys, you came from a monkey, not me. <laughs> you 
All right? It's true because it's dumb enough to think that in the first place. They must be monkeys. All right? But I'm a human being. All right? And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So you notice there were two very important trees. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 15 now until verse 17. Then the Lord God took the animal or took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. In other words, enjoy the garden that I've made for you. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So first we want to talk about, if I can call it symbolically, the tree of choice. Throughout Scripture, there is a number of things that are tied together. If you read from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament, you'll see how it all links together. That was intentional by God. Right from creation all the way back to the book of Revelation, there is woven a connection throughout Scripture. And to this day, I'm still amazed at how this all ties in. Written by totally different men of the Bible, different people of the Bible, but at the same time, all tied in. That's the power of the Word of God. So one of these connections, if you look very carefully, is the connection of trees within the Bible. We will investigate now and explore the connections a bit more thoroughly. But God says very clearly, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there He put the man. So creation then was made for us. It wasn't made for the animals. The animals were part of creation. Okay? Man made, sorry, God made creation for man to enjoy. The whole entire earth is the playground of man. That's why we love to explore it. From the oceans, depths, all the way to the mountains. And we even try to get on top of Mount Everest, the highest peak. We fly in the sky and we see all these wonderful things. And so the earth was really a special place. But there was even a more special place that God wanted man to be in, and that was in Eden. And so the Garden of Eden, if I could say it, was where man was meant to reside. A place where the goodness of God would flow, and He made it available to man readily. You could go into that garden, and He said, all the trees here, All the things that I've made in this garden, they're for you. They're good to your eyes and they're provision for you to eat. Like I preached this morning, man did not have to work for that. He was placed there in the goodness of God and everything that he needed was there. If I could say this garden is really the will of God for man. Let's tie that in for a minute. God will plant you where He needs you. God will put you in the Garden of Eden on this earth or the will of God into your life. And where you are strategically placed in your life is called the will of God. The only time where we are outside of the will of God is when we disobey or we remove ourselves from His will. He will never force you Out of His will, only you do. Think about that for a minute. He gives you free will. And with that free will, if I could call it choices, you make the decisions to be in the will of God or to be out of the will of God. The default position for human beings is meant to be in the will of God. That's the default position. It's only when we start to disobey, we fall out of the will of God. 
So within this beautiful oasis called Eden, as described by God, there are two trees that reside in this wonderful garden. The tree of life, which I'll talk about more in more detail, my third point. And then the tree of knowledge or good and evil. It's interesting how a lot of people who are knowledgeable or so-called intellects think they know what is good and what is evil. But in actual fact, they've got no idea. And so not forgetting, we have to understand there was also an array of trees within this garden besides those two trees. And God gave to Adam freely to enjoy this tree. And he said to them, all these trees that you have, enjoy it. This is the picture of humanity. We may have all the goodness of the garden and everyone in it, everything in it is good for us. All the trees, if I could say it, is available to you. You know, when you live on earth, you can look at all the things that you have abundantly. Right? You got sunlight, that's good for you. Air, that's good for you. Water, that's good for you. You didn't do anything for that. You can go up to a fruit tree and, you know, if it's not owned by anyone, you can grab it and eat and go, wow. You know, just down the road in the corner of this street, I take the bins out every Monday. And there's a mulberry tree that overhangs. And this mulberry tree is lovely because the fruits are there. And in the case, you know, I'm with the bins, oh, cut the, cut the pieces of mulberries. And God gives it to you freely. And so this is the picture of what God does for humanity. All the trees are available. But you notice about human beings, we have a tendency to always go after the things that we shouldn't touch. You notice that? The forbidden things. Don't have that. And you go, oh, really? Why not? Why not? Why can't I try it? You know, like you shouldn't try crack cocaine, okay? That's not good for you. All right? You shouldn't try to drink petrol. That's not good for you. All right? But people do those things. Have you noticed? Like even the French, they eat frog's legs. Like what in the world do you have to think before you're desperate enough to eat frog's legs? Think about that. You must have been pretty desperate to eat something like that. I've tried it, I must admit. And everything you try tastes like chicken for some reason. Just a bit tender. But we, by nature, are quite rebellious we have this spirit about us and that spirit has come from the DNA of Adam, which we have inherited because of his disobedience. So every time we disobey, we are literally saying to God, I want to go back to the same actions as my great, great, great parents, Adam and Eve. That's what you're saying to him. But we all know what happened to Adam and Eve. They got removed out of the Garden of Eden purely because they did not listen. And the reason they didn't listen? Because they wanted to eat from the fruit of good and evil. Now, if you have children... The last thing you want to do is corrupt them. That's why parents, you know this, uh, you know, certain conscientious parents, oh, you know what, my little baby, Charlie, he can't have any sugar until he's 16. <laughs> All right? I can't. You cannot give him any lollies until he's 16. You know, but mum and dad are having a packet of, you know, Kit Kat every day and a chocolate feast, you know, you know every evening. But we do this because we don't want to corrupt them. I had a friend that I knew. He married a lovely lady, innocent. Like literally, she was like, you know, from this house and this household was just very pure in the sense of the way they brought her up. She had never gone to a nightclub in her whole entire life. 
She had never drank alcohol in her entire life. She had never been with a man in her entire life. He married this pure girl, if I could say it. And you know the ignorant thing about him? Because since we're married now, baby, since you've never tried that, I'll take you nightclubbing. Like, that's crazy stuff. And so he takes her nightclubbing, introduces her to alcohol, and corrupts her when he had something pure. And this is the problem with man. We have this DNA to always corrupt things that are pure. This is what God was saying to Adam. Why do you want to touch that tree? You were pure in my eyes. Even though you were naked, you were pure. You could not sin. But instead, you wanted supposedly knowledge. This is the curiosity of people. They dabble in things that they don't know about and then they end up slaves to it. So this tree of good and evil actually represents, and note this, it's taking the authority to do good into your own eyes. That's what that tree represents. You think you can do good by your own authority. And this is governed purely by your choices. Free will now becomes a curse to mankind because he is now able to choose something outside of the will of God. That's really scary. This is why our choices have to be analyzed precisely in line with God's will for you because if it doesn't, it will become a curse to you, a hindrance to you, because your divine purpose then gets redirected. How many of us have wasted years living a life outside of the will of God and then you get saved and you go, why didn't I do this like 20 years ago? Life would have been so much better for me. I say that all the time. I got saved in my 20s and I said, I wish I was born into a Christian family. I wish my dad and mommy just slapped me in the back of the head and said, go to church. Get saved. Love Jesus. Would have saved me a lot of pain, a lot of heartache, and a lot of pain for other people as well who I loved. So the, this tree was a symbol that God really loved us. And this symbol was saying to us, I love you so much, I'm going to let you choose what you want to do with your life. That's real love. Real love lets you choose. And so God put that tree in, not because he wanted you to sin. He put that tree in as a symbol to you to say, this is how much I love you. I let you choose what you want to do. God will never force you to do anything. At the same time, God is completely aware of what you are capable also of handling. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, um, if God was so good, how come there's temptation? How come I can be tempted? Well, temptation is not sin. Sin is only when you start participating in the temptation. You can be tempted and actually not sin. Jesus was tempted for 40 days, but he still did not sin. Because God also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will always make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You can be tempted and God will say, that's common and I will give you a door to exit. So if Adam and Eve were capable of sinning against God in the perfect setting of the Eden, in the perfect fellowship of God daily, how much more than that we must be as human beings on this earth, living in a sinful environment, have to be diligent to make sure 
that we obey God. We must be extra vigilant then, if I could call it, of how the enemy may be able to ensnare us. And this is God saying in his word in Genesis, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to sight and good for food. So all these other trees were very pleasant to sight and good. You know, the devil loves you to see the tree that God doesn't want you to touch. He will make it very pleasant in your eyes. That's what sin is. Sin always looks very pleasant when you first see it. You notice it's like, oh, look at the shiny part of that. It's got to be a bling to it. It looks very pleasant, very alluring until you eat it. A knife is very shiny as well to a child, but you would never let them play with a knife. It will hurt them. And so this is the the factor here. So God is saying, I've given you all this garden, all this provision, but what you're focusing on is what you don't have. That's crazy. When you look back at your life now, Consider the things you have. I mean it, really. Everything that you have. If I told you to write a list of what you have that is good for you, you could write a lot of things. But you notice in your life, you tend to think about the bad things, the things that you don't have. All right? And that's really bad. Like if, if you are one of those people that, that, that does that, I recommend you write a list of all the good stuff and stick it on your mirror. All right? All right? If you've got hair, you should write, man, I've got a full set of hair. Oh, yeah. Or <laughs> right, everyone says to me, Dean, you've got no gray hair. I go, amen. I'm going to write that down. I have a full set of black hair. Yeah. <laughs> I save a lot of money on hair dye. Do you see what I'm saying? You've got to mark these good things. And when you read these things out loud to yourself, you realize how good your life is. Because the reality of what we do is that we tend to gravitate to the things we don't have that forces us then to fall into sin. Because we, we are carnal people. That's the nature of who we are. We have an insatiable spirit that just longs and wants things all the more and more and more. All the time. You know, when the iPhone 12 came out, which is not long ago, there was still a queue outside the Apple store in the city. I'm thinking, you know there's going to be another iPhone 13 coming out soon. Why are you bothering lining up? But they were all there with their face masks on, waiting to get into the shop. Like a bunch of dummies. I don't understand that. I just wait for a couple of years and the price drops to half and then I buy it. And I don't have to line up either. Because this insatiable appetite that we have is what the devil targets. And this insatiable appetite only targets our carnality. This is why, ladies, you look at shoes, there's always a prettier pair the next week. All right? There's always a prettier dress. All right? And guys... Electronics, I know you got you know you see the electronics and you can get excited. And you know, in Stephen's case, tools, you know, he goes to Bunnings and he thinks it's Christmas, you know. <gasps> wow, it's a cordless one that's got an extra volt to it. I can do it faster. You know, you get excited about that, you know. I go to Bunnings and I buy stuff that I don't even need. I do it all the time. I just get excited. And so what we gotta understand is that. We have to have spiritual discipline knowing this. 
The discipline is for us to stop and to oppose our carnal desire. If you can control that, if you can oppose that, and if you're disciplined in that, you're going to have a good Christian life. A very good Christian life. And learn to be satisfied with what you have. Learn to be content and enjoy what God has given you and learn to discipline your desire. That is something that you've got to teach yourself. No one can else teach you that. No one. I try to teach my kids that by the word N-O. No. I want that. No. They get used to that. And as they get older, they have to learn to say that to themselves. I go to the shop. I want that. No. No. Because in adulthood, there's no one that's going to force you to say no. Except you. Think about that for a minute. And so the way we fall into temptation is we eradicate that word no in our lives. And that means we're not disciplined enough. You know, from people being on drugs to people who are overweight to people who have, you know, mental disorder. It's all the fact if they can't say no. The desire for more, if I could call it this, can be defined as temptation. So let's talk about the next tree now, the tree of revelation. When I was overseas, uh, I was doing a revival in one of these churches overseas. And if you've ever seen me in revival services, I'm in a different mode. All right, It's like the pastor, (laughs) evangelist. Mode comes in. And I start to give words to people. I start to pray for people and things like that. I take off my pastoral hat and I start to nail in for the things of God for the individuals at that particular church. And so I start to give words to people, quite accurate words, and words that describe people's situation. I've always prayed that I'm not going to give a very generic word to a person. You are loved by God. Like anyone can say that. All right? Even though it's true. But I want to say certain things like, you know what? This day, in this place, you were on your knees and you were wearing a red shirt and you were praying these specific words and God spoke to you, but you were still in doubt and you go, wow, 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 how does he know all this stuff? And then suddenly you realize that God is talking about you. And they're the types of words that I want to give people. And so this wife of the pastor who I was, you know, Preaching in says, Pastor Dean, how do you get these accurate words? And I'm going to explain to you now also how. I said to her, it's really God allowing me to come into his presence. It's that when I'm in his presence, he reveals to me his inner heart, if I could call it, to the people, his character, his nature, and who he is. And the moment I'm captivated by his presence, I start to see like him. I start to feel like him. And I start to hear like him. And that magnifies my experience. And when that does, I can relay exactly how he feels about you, how he sees you, how he hears you. And this is the exact description of the burning bush. Exodus chapter 3 verses 2 to 5. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, this is Moses, in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses says, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and says, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. So the burning bush that appears to Moses is actually 
A place where man is brought into the realm of God. What that means is that God will give you glimpses of Him, but it's up to you to turn aside from your daily routine and actually go towards Him. Moses was tending after sheep in the wilderness. He sees this fire. He feels the unction of the Holy Spirit, the calling of God. But instead of saying, I'm going to ignore that, I'm going to go back to my business and do what I do daily. He goes, no, no, I want to set aside. And the moment he set aside and looked and pursued God, God called his name. And within this burning bush, as he stepped into the realm of God's presence, God immediately says to him, you are on holy ground, take off your sandals. Now the only time you take off your sandals is when you're in holy ground, the presence of God. He's technically, supposedly meant to be in the bush right now. But the moment God appears to him, that signifies that he's entered the presence of God. And he goes, take off your shoes, brother. This place is clean, pure. So this revelation now becomes really a glimpse of God. And Moses then is totally submersed into this presence of God. No different to the way when he went up to Mount Sinai for 40 days where the presence of God was so much that when he came down from the mount, he was glowing. There's times where you go into the presence of God and you come out totally different. You know, my wife came and joined me in the Philippines after three weeks of preaching. Like literally every day I was preaching. She arrives in the Philippines to, for me to head off into you know, Vietnam to continue my preaching. And she said to me, Dean, you glowed. She hadn't seen me for about two and a half weeks. And she said, when I saw you, you glowed. There was an anointing and a presence. I couldn't even come near you. This is what God does. When you come into the presence of God, you just reflect Him. The devil, before he became the devil, Lucifer reflected God because he was in the presence of God all the time. He actually shone so much that, you know, he was able to deceive the other angels to think he was God and say, follow me. Look how much I'm shining. So revelation is a revealing of God's word, plan and heart for his people. This is why when you read further on, he says, I hear the cries of my people in the burning bush. He says those words. Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 to 8. And the Lord says, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. For I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land full or a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Petrosites, and the Hevites, and the Jebusites. And so you hear that God hears the cry of His people, the oppression that they are enduring. God knows it. And so I want to break this up a little bit. The first thing you need to do is come crying to God. That's another word, that's prayer. The presentation of prayer and your plea to God, He will see it, He will hear it, and He will deal with the injustice for you. This is why you don't have to fight for injustice. God will do it for you as long as you pray. Because we know the world is very unfair out there. All right, we know that. All right? Even we, we think the judges need to be righteous. They're crooks in some cases. Some police officers are crooks. Not all of them, but we know there are. And so for justice to flow well, we need to pray. Because God is the only one that can make those things right. So He's aware of your sorrows. Secondly, then God comes to deliver His people with His power. So Moses now sees and hears the cry of God's people 
And he also says, send a deliverer. And he picks Moses because now Moses is in the midst of it. And out of the 40 years that he's been living in the wilderness, he now wants to go back and deliver God's people. That only came because he was in the midst of God. Because our natural progression is to run away from our past, run away from our mistakes. Because Moses was a murderer. He had murdered someone in Egypt and he ran away for 40 years instead of, you know, standing up for his error, correcting his mistakes. It took God to deal with his heart. It took him coming to the presence of God for him to say, yeah, you know what? I do have a problem with my anger. I do have a problem with being, you know, a coward and running away from all my issues. And God makes him confront Pharaoh. But at the same time, God uses this man's error to help him deliver God's people. Your mistakes will ultimately become a place where God will deal with, but it will set other people free as well. This is the power of forgiveness, for instance. This is the power of repentance, for instance. This is the power of addictions being broken, for instance. And when you can tell people that God did this for you, they too can be set free. That's why testimony is so powerful. Thirdly, out of deliverance then comes blessings. The the complete deliverance of people will always flow through into blessings. You may be so held in sin, bound with, you know, sin and the demonic and curses and everything. But when God delivers you completely and you let Him do that, blessings flow. Because you notice He says, once I deliver you, I'm going to put you into the land of milk and honey. Now, blessing is only attached to obedience. He gives you the blessing, but if you don't obey, you are never going to receive it. Those Israelites had the deliverance, had the promise, but that whole generation died in the wilderness. Why? Because they disobeyed. But the promise was always there. The next generation inherited the promises. And they enjoyed the land of milk and honey. So in the midst of this tree of revelation, you have access to God's heart. So when you understand this now, you should be praying for God's revelation. God, take me into that burning bush experience. And I'm talking about that profound experience where you're on your face, on your knees, and you're weeping so much, or you're just knocked out by the Holy Spirit, and you just go, Woo! I'm in for a ride! And you come out to the midst of life and you realize, I don't want to be here. I want to be back in the midst of God. This is why when you speak to people who've had encounters with God or they've even been taken to heaven and places like that, they go, I don't want to come back to earth. It was so good being in the presence of God. We may think that life in this world is actually all about us. I'm sad to tell you, it's not. It's actually about the will of God. The more you get closer to God, the more you will realize it's not about you. It's not. And what happens is that you become closer to God and you realize that you're only part of the plan. You are in God's will as well, but God uses you to fulfill the will of His people. This is why we are connected. This is why people are so important in Christianity. You cannot be an isolated Christian. Okay? If you're an isolated Christian, you are having issues because you're going to hate heaven. You're going to go up to heaven and go, Hey, what are all these people doing here? I, 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 I'm not meant to be here. I like isolation. You know where isolation is? It's in hell. Hell has no fellowship with other people. 
And so if you're a Christian and like isolation, there is something profoundly wrong with your belief, even if you think you're a Christian. Now let's talk about the tree of life now as I conclude. This is what Jesus is described as in the Word of God, the vine. And we are the branches. John chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. The vine is where we as the branches need to be connected to. For the branch to survive, it has to be connected to the vine. If the vine is disconnected from the so if the branch is disconnected from the vine, we call that a stick. A stick is dead. You know what a stick is good for? To be put into the fire. This is why God says, I will bundle them up and I will put them in the fire because they are not a part of me. And so the moment you disconnect yourself from the true tree, the vine itself, you become dead. So without connection, it is impossible for us to produce fruit. Everything that flows to the branch comes from the vine. Whatever good things you have has come purely from the vine. This is why for you to remain fruitful, to remain within the purpose of the will of God and to always have the joy of the Spirit, you have to have connection with the vine. But let me tell you also, for you to have fruit, there are seasons that you produce fruit. An apple tree does not have apples all year round. Okay? There are seasons where the fruit is produced. Like, I love mangoes, all right? But mangoes only come in summer. And if you want to eat a mango in winter, it's a frozen one from Woolies in a plastic bag. You can't get fresh mangoes in the middle of winter. And so if you understand that fruit will come to you, but there is a cycle that it has to work through for it to produce. And sometimes that's some harsh environments. You know the sweetest oranges that you've ever eaten have to have a cold snap weather-wise to make it produce sweetness. Sometimes God has to give us a bit of a cold snap to make us sweet. So the final tree, this tree of life. This tree of life is actually represented by the cross. This is why the Bible describes the cross as the tree. He died on that tree for us. He hung on that tree for us. So from this tree, this is where death was taken care of by God. And from that tree, if I can call it the new tree of life, all of mankind now has life. So before the tree of life in the Garden of Eden that provided the life into the garden, now earth or humankind has the tree or the cross that sat on top of Calvary that we go to now to have new life, to be rebirthed into the Spirit of God, to have life itself. This is why we must go to the cross to receive life because that cross was the payment for your sin. And with that payment, you were able to have a new life. Calvary is really important to us then. So from Calvary, a new life was birthed to those who would come into His presence. This is why the Christians look at the cross all the time. Not a symbol of torture for our Saviour, but a symbol of payment and a symbol of new life for us. God, out of this tree, you were able to birth eternal life for us because while we were in our sins, we were dead. So when Adam sinned eating that tree of good and evil, and if Adam was not removed from that garden and was still in the midst of the tree of life, 
he would have lived forever with sin. And so picture this for a minute. We now have a tree that was able to forgive us of all our sin. God planted that tree for us to see with His Lord, with His Son, Lord Jesus, on it. And so every time we do things wrong, if I could say it, and we do, even Christians, we make mistakes. We need to go back to that tree and say, God, forgive me. God, give me life again. Acknowledge that payment and receive that tree of life and let it flow to you once more. Because this is where we get access, unlimited access. Adam Adam didn't have that. But you do. This is why that tree called the cross is so important to humans. Without the cross, you wouldn't have life. And so I'll close with this now. In that garden of Eden, I believe that tree of life was actually Jesus himself. Picture that for a minute. Because everything came from that tree of life that birthed life itself. And we know in Scripture, everything was created for him, with him, and through him. And now God clearly states that and stamps it on Calvary and says, look, this is my son. Come and receive life, eternal life. Amen. Let's bow our heads tonight. Let's close our eyes for a minute as we come into the presence of God. God bless you for coming out tonight to hear the word of God. Hopefully this word has helped you to understand the importance of the cross the importance of that tree of life that was that bared the, the sin of all of mankind by our Lord Saviour. So I come before you now and ask you, maybe you don't know Jesus Christ. I know the bulk of you here and maybe you're listening online or maybe you're new here and, and I don't know you, but your heart, can feel the conviction of God. You know that you don't have life completely and abundantly. The cross was for you maybe a symbol, a religious symbol. You know, people get a tattoo, wear around their neck, all these things, but it has no symbolic remnants or importance. But now you've heard this sermon and you realize that the cross is the, the cross is the tree of life for you. The tree that gave you life because it was Jesus Christ that paid for it. And maybe while you're in your sin, you are not a Christian. And if you died tonight, you wouldn't know where you went. You wouldn't believe that you would make it into heaven. And if that's you tonight and, and you want to make sure that you make it to heaven. I want you just to lift your hands up and say, God, that's me. I need your forgiveness. Amen. And if you're watching online and that is really you and you need Jesus Christ in your life, it's as simple as saying a prayer and asking God to forgive your sin, to become your Lord and your Savior. Locking into a church, reading the Word of God and praying. But let me speak to the church for a minute. Do you know where your life started from? And I'm not talking about the birth, a your mother's womb. I'm talking about real life. Your life is connected to the cross. Your life is a symbol of God's love through what His Son did on that cross. And if God is stirring you tonight and maybe God is speaking to you and you need to get a few things off your chest 
and you need to make some resolution and, and also some decisions, and you've been convicted by this Word, I open the altars for you tonight. Come out, stand up, come out to your, come out to the front, speak to God. The altars are open, church. Come and speak to Him this evening. If the cross has any symbolic remnants to you, now is the time to acknowledge that. Now is the time to realize that you need Jesus Christ in your life. Oh God, I just thank you, Lord, for the profound goodness of the cross. I thank you, God, for how good you are to us. That everything that we have flows from you, God. He actually flows from that wonderful Messiah of ours. Father, let us know you deeper and deeper. Let us not ever take life for granted. Father, even what we have right now, the fact that we are breathing, God, it's birthed out of the tree of life. Your Son, Jesus Himself. The fact that our heart is beating right now, we are conscious and we are able to even utter these words of prayer and glory to You. It's because of that tree of life, Your Son, Jesus. Father, let us not be fooled by this world. Let us not be fooled by knowledge. The Bible clearly says that they perceived to be wise, but they were fools in the eyes of God. Father, we know everything that is good comes from You. And just as it is in heaven, God, the waters of life will flow from Your throne, provide life to all of heaven. And Father, let us drink from that water of life. The wonderful blessings and the hope and the joy There are some people here, you're not living to your fullest potential. And what I mean by that is, you're preoccupied with too many things. Things which are really actually quite irrelevant when it comes to the gospel. When it comes to what God has available to you. You are so distracted that all it does, it stops you from fulfilling the great purpose of God in your life. And God is speaking to you right now to remove that, to repent of that, to eradicate that from your life. It's like you're trying to find this tree of knowledge and this tree of good and evil and you continue to want to eat from this tree and all it's going to do is remove you from the presence of God, from the Eden that you're meant to be in. You don't want to be there. You don't want to be in that situation, church. You don't want to be removed out of the presence of God. Especially if you're pursuing those worldly carnal things, knowledge of good and evil. And it may be a whole stack of things disguised as distractions, interruptions, and even carnal desires, possessions. 
Let me tell you, you are not going to take anything with you when you die. Even the things that you deem important, they're going to sit here and just going to rot on earth while you meet your Lord Saviour. When my dad died, all his life he's worked. But not one thing was he able to take with him. He dedicated his hard-earned life, yes, to pursue good things for his family and even his children. And I bless him for that. But let me tell you, he didn't take anything with him. So don't let those things, those carnal desires, discipline yourself, church. It's not worth it. Go and drink from the tree of life, not from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Go to the tree of life and seek that profound calling of God over you. Because that's where you're going to really find purpose, fulfillment, joy, peace, happiness, prosperity, if I can even use that term, abundance. Oh, Father, let this word, God, stick so hard within their hearts, piercing God into their soul. Let them understand this, Lord, and know this. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen. Let's stand up, church. Let's close in a word of prayer. God has met with us tonight. God has spoken words to us. Amen. To help us to do His will. If I could ask my son Josiah just to close us in a word of prayer, nice and loud. Amen. Glory to God. Amen.